to formally introduce Melissa Elliott, who is the Director of Strategic Communications Services for RefTelus. Her over 25 year experience in public relations is focused on helping water and wastewater utilities and municipalities tell their stories. She oversees strategic communication planning, stakeholder engagement, and risk communication strategies for RefTelus, and also serves as the president-elect of the American Water Works Association. So Melissa is going to walk us through the value of partnering with others and how you can start to address some of the communication challenges you have listed here through partnerships. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for that nice introduction. Well, as we heard at the start of the workshop, water is complex. Yet it's something that we all experience the value of every day. And if you think about it, there's a rich irony there. Our constituents and our customers would recognize the value of water instantly if they didn't have access to it. And in some ways, we've made the acquisition, the supply, treatment, and distribution of water to our communities even more complicated because it's a highly localized service. The dozens of water districts, municipal utilities, and water agencies within our watershed have borders that zig and zag without much connection to the customers they serve. In short, if you're a customer, customer or consumer, this great big world of water works great until it doesn't. And that's when they might wonder how the service gets to them anyway. One thing we can do to help our constituents and our customers and ourselves is to look for ways we can partner uh, to provide mutual benefit, especially when it comes to communication. A partnership is a formalized alliance of interested parties that join together for a specific cause or change to achieve a mutually desired outcome that they may not have been able to accomplish on your own. You've probably been a part of a partnership or a coalition with others before. Maybe you've been asked to join, but you may not have actually been the one responsible for building the partnership from scratch. And although it may look simple or like something that happens organically, successful partnerships actually share some common themes. And I want to highlight a couple of areas that are ripe for a partnership that come directly out of the survey you took when you registered for this workshop. So on the next slide, um, I, I have up here <laughs> the pressure to limit rate increases or cut costs. We've already seen a lot of that in the chat today, and it, it sure popped up on your survey. And boy, isn't this an issue right now? Unemployment soaring and that next rate increase may not look too appetizing to governing bodies. Um, if you aren't already implementing them, budget cuts are likely coming. Um, and you can handle all that on your own, or you can look for others to partner with. There are 100 water districts in this watershed, and it's pretty much guaranteed that every one of them has billing software, you're reading meters, you've got to purchase equipment, you're doing payroll, et cetera. What if some of those services were shared? What if neighboring agencies or districts assess the services they provided and work collaboratively to identify ways that they could get costs? Perhaps that would even mean the ability to not fill a vacant position by outsourcing the work to a neighboring agency. It's kind of complicated, I get it, but not unheard of. I'm currently working with seven neighboring water districts in Northern California that are working together to address water resource and shared infrastructure issues. And part of their in-depth study on this is to identify and look for ways they can share services. They're highly aware that it's hard to demonstrate cost cutting, but they think they can come up with some collaborative ways to keep costs down or stable by relying on each other. And on the next slide, this is another piece that came up is, gosh, how do we make sure people are recognizing that, yeah, all right, Droughts come and go, but we always need to be using water wisely in our region. So another example here is the value of partnering on messaging, rules and ordinances that are related to water efficiency, so that as people go about their day, they see similar messages at work, school, home, even you know, when we get back to socializing. Messages don't respect geographic borders. We tend to carry them with us throughout the day. So many of you mentioned in your survey that you had challenges with communicating conservation and getting attention for the educational message you're sending because it competes with everything else in the current environment. And education campaigns that are successful at garnering attention can also be really expensive. So pooling resources and collaborating can save money and result in consistent communication to customers across an entire region. And that can result in greater impact of that message and more effective actions taken by your customers. On the next slide, I wanna go through, you know, just why 
you might, and with some reasons that you might have from partnering a coalition, uh, building a coalition. And it's true that we can be more successful together than when we go alone. So partnerships and coalitions can be used to address an urgent need, empower partners to take control of their future, secure funding, increase communications among groups, revitalize that sagging energy of those folks who try to do too much alone. And you can really develop some clout when you band together. And that way you can gain some benefits um, for your partners. And on the next slide, we'll talk a bit about number one, securing funding. So I'm currently working with a coastal Oregon utility that has two dams that are at significant risk should there be an earthquake in that region. And earthquakes happen a lot in coastal Oregon. Um, and frankly, they would lose their entire water supply um, if that happens. And um, that would just be catastrophic, not just on a life safety basis, but the economic damage, if you could imagine that happening in your community, would be huge if those dams fail. They've identified a way to fix this. It cost $70 million and they have 10,000 people in their community. So there is just no way they can afford to pay for that um, on their own through rate increases to their, to their uh, community. So instead, they worked regionally. They created a partnership. This is an economic center in, uh, in coastal Oregon and they worked to get partners who may not be, you know, uh, fiscally or, or financially responsible for the dams like they are, but boy, they rely on them. And they, they went with this coalition to the state legislature um, to get funding for dam repairs. And they've been able to get enough so far to pay for the actual design of the project. And now they're using their coalition to push for federal funding as well. And none of that would have happened without a partnership. On the next slide, you know, many of you are elected officials. And I bet you have experienced this before where it just feels like you're pushing and pushing and pushing and it gets tiring. I mean, elected officials often have an amazing amount of energy to begin with. You wouldn't be who you are if you didn't. But when you're really, really trying um, to push an initiative or make change that you really need, um, pulling together and bringing other people into that can really be helpful. So leveraging the support of others can help you rebalance your energy and with the help of a partnership, you can really move forward. On this next slide, I wanna talk about the roadmap that all good successful partnerships follow. There really is a bit of a formula to this. So in your last workshop, you spent some time focusing on breakthrough collaboration. And as a reminder, there were several building blocks to building your capacity to collaborate. You discussed trust building and creativity, negotiation and joint action. And these last two building blocks, the negotiation on a common goal and taking action are the foundation of what we're going to talk about next. So successful partnerships follow a roadmap. They don't just happen. And here's the steps involved. First, you're going to actually build a coalition. You're gonna identify the right people and the right organizations that connect to your initiative. And I'm gonna to touch a bit on that a little later about how do I find those right people? And next, you're going to form a strategic vision and initiatives. And that really relates significantly to that creativity building block from the last workshop. As you develop your strategic vision, remember that historically, public agencies tend to play the expert role and engage communities only after they've gone out and figured out the solution to the problem. And uh, in your last session, we learned that we really need to try to flip that and use the data collection process as a form of community engagement and relationship building. We wanna ask before we develop the final solution. So doing that is gonna make it a lot easier to enlist those stakeholders and communicate, which is the next step. Then you wanna generate short-term wins and you wanna celebrate a lot when you get those wins. So as you learned in your last workshop, this is a critical juncture. This is kind of sometimes where we either succeed or fail, right? So in practice, joint actions reinforce the virtuous collaborative circle where more gains will help to institutionalize collaborative relationships. So it starts with those small wins. In practice, it's very important to celebrate and publicize these initial successes. Um, you know, think about it. Maybe you and a group of uh, stakeholders come up to a, a good agreement on how to manage maybe a river cleanup. And the first step um, strengthens that relationship and leads to stakeholders to commit to the next joint action. 
And that might be working together to reiterate or secure those gains. So in the example of the river cleanup, maybe you're committing to monitoring the cleanup uh, effort together. And then you celebrate that. And in the act of taking small steps, you realize the potential of your coalition. It's not just this small thing anymore. It's growing and it's accelerating. And in doing that, for example, in the river cleanup, maybe you start and you create a joint river monitoring team that meets regularly to review what the team finds. So once you get those small wins under your belt, you're going to be able to gain acceleration, which ultimately leads to actually instituting the change your partnership wants to see. <clears throat> and on the next slide, so let's talk about one example. And we went through this in your last workshop quite a bit, but the One Water, One Watership Plan for, um, from SAPA um, is an integrated regional water management plan um, for the entire watershed and represents a culmination of the work of over 300 stakeholders and agencies in the watershed who work together to analyze, develop, and describe new integrated implementation actions needed to address the water challenges facing the watershed. The One Water, One Watershed Plan reflects a collaborative planning process that addresses all aspects of water resources in the watershed. And it includes planning of future water demands and supplies over a 20 year time horizon within the watershed as a hydrologic and interconnected system. And you're going to hear an example after I speak of another local example of partnering um, in the community and with other jurisdictions to make things happen. On the next slide, let's talk about all right, you know, hey, I've probably convinced you partnerships are a really great investment for your agency. And we've had some examples about different ways to communicate the value of water while tying water back to our communities. But partnerships themselves can be focused on the exact goal that we're here today on to work on. If you think back on the survey many of you participated in, you were asked to highlight a concern that you really wanted to address about communicating about water. And many of you mentioned an interest in reaching out to your communities um, to get diverse perspectives. And a partnership can be one way to get started on addressing this interest because the beauty is you don't have to do it all alone. But how do you get those informal networks off the ground? Where do you start? So after you clearly define what it is you want to do and you put that into a compelling elevator speech, you got to find the right people. And where do you find them? So here's a few considerations to think about as you're thinking through who do I know and who can I put together? You wanna to start by identifying organizations that already work on the identified issue and look broadly for other organizations that should be involved. So don't just keep it to government agencies, right? You, these can be nonprofits, community and industry organizations, even individuals. And on that note, sometimes that the, you wanna include an individual because who's not really affiliated with an organization because they can perform a few functions that sometimes we can't if we're a public official a public sector so um for example they might be able to testify before a city council or a legislature where a city staff member might not be able to and then you want to think about who you might want to exclude too and that although we'd like to be really inclusive sometimes we have adversaries that or a problem for one organization that you might be really tightly connected with and then you've got another organization and you got to kind of think through how you might want to navigate that in advance so it doesn't derail you later. Um, you want to consider who, who in the organization is best to represent that organization in the partnership too. So often participation from both top leadership or elected officials and staff is essential to achieving a partnership goal because the leader can really be influential while the staff can really be the doer. And then of course you want to aim for an appropriate membership size for your partnership. It needs to be just large enough to achieve your goal. You know, really if you get groups larger than 12 to 18 people, you're gonna require maybe more resources and sometimes it just takes longer to develop stronger ties. So really think clearly about who you want and what the size of the group. And the next slide, we wanna get this partnership flowing. So you figured out why you want to partner, you know who you want to partner with. Here's how you create some energy around the partnership. You're going to want to communicate consistently and regularly. And boy, you've heard that already from us. Um, and you're going to hear it the rest of your workshop too. Consistent communications that are inclusive and also participatory. Okay. 
that networking and constantly seeing each other, even if it's on a Zoom call, is really critically important to keep people's mind focused on what it is you're trying to achieve. And you want to set concrete, reachable goals. Remember those small wins. But you should be really realistic and keep your promises. When we do partnerships, sometimes what we find is that scope creep is a really real thing for, uh, especially when you get successful. You know, other people look at your partnership and they say, boy, they're really able to do a lot. I think they could solve my problem too. And so it's really easy to get sidelined by multiple requests from individuals who see successes in your partnership and are giving you things to do that may not fit exactly with your mission. So on the next slide, um, let's talk just a bit on kind of the downsides of partnerships because they do fail. And I'm sure many of you have had experiences where you've been a part of something like this and it feels kind of bad when this happens because nobody ever wants that um, intention. So if you've, um, some of the common partnership challenges that you might want to address is, is some bad history be behind organizations. That's why I mentioned, boy, you might want to find out if there's some adversarial relationships here before you launch because they really can derail you. The next one often is weak links in the, to the community. So uh, picking players and partners that have some influence and can bring and draw others in um, is really critically important. The third reason partnerships fail is just minimal organizational capacity. And that really speaks to the size and scope of what you're trying to do. So if you pull together 30 individuals you know, we're, we, most of us all have day jobs too, in addition to all the other work that we're doing. How do you um, do that without staff, right? So organizational capacity can be a real challenge. And last um, reason that partnerships fail is just the failure to provide and create leadership within the coalition of the partnership. Um, we all like to keep everybody on an equal plane, but you really do need to identify leaders and the role that the leader is gonna take within the partnership for others to continue to move it forward. And then on the last slide, I just want to highlight some, um, you know, some real highlights and kind of bring everything uh, back together. And that is that partnerships should really obviously bring mutual um, benefits. And the water agencies, local governments, were really just a natural reason to partner there. Um, Common messaging, I mentioned that with conservation, but there's lots of other, we've, we've talked about regulation and the need to protect our water sources. Um, those are all great things to do common messaging on um, throughout our, our communities. And of course, those short-term wins, I can't stress that enough. So um, make sure you think through those, those lessons learned. Most of you have been involved in something like this before, and I'm sure there were lessons learned that you can take into your next partnership. And with that, I'll close, thank you. Great, thank you.